Next on the Broadway show, it's a wickedly good anniversary. We're celebrating with the stars on the 20th anniversary of Wicked. Plus, the window is closing to see Melissa Etheridge on Broadway. I'm chatting with the Grammy winning rock star. Also ahead. I'm Charlie Cooper and coming up next, I'm chatting with Isabel McCalla, who stars in the corniest musical on Broadway. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. The Broadway Show is back with another stacked episode. I'm Tamsin Fidel, so let's get started. First up, we're celebrating two decades of Wicked, 20 years of Defy Gravity, and on the night of the anniversary performance, Wicked alums from the past join the current cast and crew for the party. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. That's right, Tamsin. There are witches to the left and the right of me on this amazing milestone night at the Gershwin Theater. You look amazing, I, and I really appreciate the Galinda Alphaba. I mean, it must have been very important for you to not take size, even though you are Alphaba OG. Well, it's both. Tonight, it's about both. I love that. Yeah, it's about celebrating um, what we've created together with the people that we've created it with, and um, it's, just, it's a tremendous sense of pride that we're feeling. Um, to be here and to to sort of be a part of this legacy. You know, you do all the hard work and then you just sort of get to be part of the legacy now. And, and it's, it's such other, a huge part of your life. To watch other girls soar in the roles, it just means that Dee and I did our part, you know? I'm so proud of us and I'm proud of everybody. So how does it feel for former Glinda, Galinda? I mean, what's it like to like be celebrating this incredible musical? It's really surreal. It, you know, it's, it's crazy to think that this musical has been thriving on Broadway for 20 years. This show was a stepping stone to, for a lot of actors to their next thing. This was a stepping stone for me to Legally Blonde. Jerry Mitchell came to see me in this show to see if I could carry a show. So I have a lot to be grateful for, my experience uh, in the trajectory of my career. There are so many witches around us right now. Yeah, oh my God, it's so it's so absurd. Like I looked around, there was Adina, I saw a Jackie. I saw hey, a look at like, your name dropping. Well, you know, I try, I strive for excellence. Uh, no, it's really freaking cool. You know, I haven't been back to the show since I left. I think I've seen the tour before, but also it's just, it's good vibes, it's fam. To be able to say, you played Alphabet at the Gershwin Theater is just something that people dream of having something like that on their resume. Yeah, it's still unbelievable. I'm getting teary-eyed just kind of thinking about the magnitude, honestly. Like, if you would have told Jenny 18 years ago when I joined the show that this was going to be where I was, I would have never believed this. It's thrilling. You just finished the 20th anniversary performance of Wicked. It's, it's a major milestone for the show, for Broadway, for amazing female actresses on Broadway. I mean, it, what a big night. How, what are the, where are the emotions now that you got through it? I think a lot of it is a relief because it's been a very big build up to this moment, but it was such an incredible thing to be able to do this really iconic show in such a special day and have an audience like that was just unlike anything I've ever experienced before. I mean, the minute the, the Glinda's bubble appeared, it was just like pandemonium. What was it like to take that in from the stage? It was amazing. I mean, there's no greater entrance than descending by bubble and saying, it's good to see me, isn't it? And having the support of so many previous Glindas and Alphabas too, which was just like meant the world. It was really? amazing, yeah. It's your last chance to see Melissa Etheridge on Broadway, her one-woman show ending its run in just a couple of weeks. We had a chance to chat. The title, My Window, appropriate for so many reasons, obviously, but also because of the fact that you have always been so open mm -hmm. with your audience and with fans and just with people and anytime I see an interview with you. And I, it's just really something that not everybody does. And you just really have made it a point to do that no matter uh, what you're going through, whether it's a high or it's a low. I found years ago when I first started uh, in the recording business, when I made my first album, I, I, was dis I was playing in lesbian bars. I was, I was out 
uh, socially and to my family and everything. And this was just music I was making. And the mainstream recording industry started coming to see me and it took about five years before someone would sign me. The record company said, well, if you don't flag wave, that's fine. And so, uh, you know, and I was like, you know, <laughs> three years later I'm flag waving. But it was a, a way to slowly, you know, be open about who I was and a few years later I came out and um, once I did that, once I kind of had the experience of being honest, man there's a lot of power in that, mm -hmm. there really is. It, you lose a lot of your power when you try to hide things and, and are always worried and it's not good for your health. So once I, once I had that experience, then when I had a, a, my health crisis, I remember people saying, oh you shouldn't tell you know, people you have cancer, they're going to think you're weak. And I was like, stop, that's the worst. The only way I'm going to get any power is to say, hey, you know, this is cancer, this is uh, my journey through it, this is what I did, this is, and you know, and now next year I'll be 20 years cancer free. So oh, I've just, you know, once I started speaking truthfully, it's more comfortable for me to be open and honest in all the ups and downs of my life. It's time to take a walk with a Broadway star, so let's send it out to Charlie Cooper. Izzy, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. We are excited to talk about Shucks, and I'm excited to walk you to work. I really appreciate the company. You yeah. get lonely on these New York City streets. Oh, I, I can imagine. <laughs> with all of these people. All of these people. <laughs> usually I'm like, get out of my way. Right, exactly. But this is nice. Focus. Yeah. <laughs> How's it been so far, though? Oh my gosh, it's been a dream. Shucked is the funniest show I have ever been a part of. The company is wonderful, the material is fantastic. It's just been the best gift. I got to get my own apartment, like rent an apartment on by myself with this money, so I'm happy. I imagine that being a part of a musical that is new mm -hmm. probably comes with some challenges, but also an exciting opportunity to do some new things. Yes, absolutely. So this show opened in March to you know rave reviews, and everybody in the city loves it. It's mm -hmm. labeled, I currently, I, th I believe, the funniest show on Broadway. There's something really special about doing a show that has zero pre-existing source material. It is just these characters that were, you know, came up out of the heads of Robert Horn and Randy Clark and Shane McAnally and it's a riot and a hoot. And what's wonderful is that because of that, there's so much room to play and just let my imagination run wild based on what's on the page. And Caroline Innerbickler, who was the original Maisie, laid a beautiful foundation mm -hmm. and she created a wonderful blueprint for me. But I've been lucky enough that Jack O'Brien and the creative team has been very um, liberating in terms of allowing me to make my own choices with her. And, and they've always been open to discussion about her curiosity and like what I think she would be thinking now. And so I've had a little wiggle room to make Maisie my own, which has yeah. been really lovely. I love that. Um, while I'm surrounded by these very grounded actors who know deeply who their characters are. Right. And so the fun math of it all has been like, okay, if I know who you are, how do I fit in, in as a cog in this wheel to make it all seamless? And so it's been a real joy. With this being a new original musical and the fact that you had that similar experience with mm -hmm. the prom, is there anything you took from that experience that you were able to inject into this experience and make it a little easier to yeah. navigate? Yeah, well I think what was great about the prom, a, it was my first original Broadway cast, which was unbelievable. The show itself was the most wonderful training ground because I was in this ensemble comedy, but I didn't have to be funny. <laughs> so I got to watch these legends like Beth Level and Brooke Sashmanskis and Krista Receiver work their magic. Yeah. And I feel like I absorbed a lot through osmosis. Um, the primary aspect being that like, you're not funny, the material's funny. Mm. And so the more you just play the truth of the, the situation, the given circumstances, yeah. the, you know, the relationship dynamics, what the genre you're in, the stakes of it all, the funnier it will be to the audience, as long as it's not funny to you. Us as the characters, we are the last people to think we're funny. Everything is very serious. So I think I like learned that from everybody at the prom and also learned the power of laughter. Is it time to get shocked? Yeah. You're at work? I'm at work. Thanks Thank for walking me to work. Thank you for letting me walk you to work. Of course. This is so fun. This is great. Break a leg. Thank you. Here Lies Love is Broadway's biggest party, a decade in the making. It's the revolutionary production about the former First Lady of the Philippines, Amelda Marcos. Here's Beth Stevens with another edition of Building Broadway. Thanks, Samson. 
Three-time Tony-nominated set designer David Corins has transformed the Broadway theater into an immersive nightclub experience for Here Lies Love. Let's go inside and take a look. Well, here we are in the Broadway theater. This was a huge undertaking for you. Yes, Tell it me, was. <laughs> how did you even approach changing the space? Honestly, this is the most complex and for sure hardest project I've ever worked on on Broadway. Like even before you can contemplate designing a show like this, you have to really think long and hard about what you're going to do to, to the physical space and who you're going to need to help you, right? There's probably 10,000 hours of conversations with architects and with engineers before you even start to think about scenery. Because the box that we built here is in fact just, it's the set, but it's also the theater. And so people stand inside of it, but they also sit on it and they look over onto it. And there is no separation between performer and audience member. There are over 38 permitted different floor plans that we had to individually permit with New York City to say, now this thing's gonna move this way, can this actually happen legally? Now this is gonna move this way, can this happen legally? That we've had to file because it's just such an ambitious piece of architecture. So let's go back yeah, yeah. to your initial conversations with director Alex Timbers. Why did Here Lies Love have to be an immersive piece? So actually, we have to go back further than that. David Byrne had this incredible idea. He saw Grace Jones do a pop-up song at Studio 54 on a platform amidst of a bunch of people standing there um, in the audience. And he thought, that's such an interesting way to present uh, a performer in the middle of an audience. File that away. Ten years later or so, he heard that Imelda Marcos loved discos and clubs. In fact, had a disco ball in her palace and had an actual disco club in her townhouse in New York City. And he said, there's got to be something here. Let me combine the two stories. He got Alex and I. We did a proof of concept at Mass Mocha 13 years ago to figure out if we could actually have performers inside of a staging device. And could we actually have stage platforms moving in and around and through the audience? But what's so cool about the show is it's immersive, but it is not really interactive. I hate and Alex hate performers like sitting on your lap or making a joke. But at times you are cast as activists, you're at a wedding, you're at a funeral, and yeah, you're at a club. You're part of but the crowd. But it is a traditional Broadway musical, just told with a bit of a presentational spin. And as you can see, there are plenty of people who are not on the dance floor, right? Exactly. I mean, I think that's one of the misconceptions about the show is people think, oh, it's a nightclub. It's as much of a nightclub, this Club Millennium, is as um, the Kit Kat Club is to Cabaret. This is a traditional Broadway musical, but 300 people get to stand up and get moved around by the scenery and get surrounded by the scenery and the performers, and another 200 or so sit in traditional seating, but looking over this big, huge box behind us. There are 800 people out of 1,100 every night sitting down, and so if you're worried about that, there's definitely a place for you. Like what you just saw, there's an exclusive extended web version of this interview over at Broadway.com. This is a Broadway show and we're back in just a few. Thanks for sticking around. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Australian pop star Betty Who just recently made their Broadway debut in the Tony Award winning musical Town. Let's send it back to Paul. That's right, Tamsin. Pop music sensation Betty Who has taken on the role of Persephone in the Tony-winning hit. We met up right here at the Broadway home of Hadestown, the Walter Kerr Theater. <laughs> Betty, welcome to Broadway. Look, this is your Broadway home, the Walter Kerr. Can you believe? Everyone is moved watching this show because it's a beautiful show, and it's now in its fifth year. On Isn't that Broadway. Crazy? I, I know mean, it's a crossed. It's in there. crossed into the one of the um, into the hundred longest running shows oh, wow. of all time. Cool. In Broadway, which cool. feels crazy because it doesn't feel like it's been. 2019 was 10 seconds ago, but. Were you like, if I'm going to do a Broadway show, it has to be one of the top 100 shows. I'm going to wait. Let me, yeah. Let's wait I until have it crosses. Standards. No, no. <laughs> I'm honestly, I, I coming into this world, you know, I, I've been saying for a couple of years, trying to take meetings and meet people and kind of get the word out that I'm a theater kid at heart and that this is somewhere I'd really love to work. 
and I did feel a little bit like I'll take what I can get about it. So the fact that I'm playing like an incredible role in one of the best Broadway shows of all time is like icing on the cake because I just wanted the cake in the first place. I just wanted to do Broadway, whatever it was. And so to be here is like more than I could have possibly imagined. Well, you actually get to start the show watching. You're observing at first. You have a great entrance. Yeah. You're, you're sort of sitting up there with Hades, to yeah. the fantastic Philip Boykin. Yeah. And then you get a great entrance and you're a party girl. Yeah. Persephone's coming down to party. I mean, she's living she it up on this. top. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Which I think is kind of parallel to what people say about you as a pop personality. Yeah. People love your shows and people have such a connection to what you do to audiences. How excited are you to welcome them to Broadway to see you yeah. in the show? I mean, it feels really special. I think I've always felt a little bit like an underdog, sort of culty, if you know, you know. Right. Because um, a lot of people don't know. And so if you do know, you're like, oh wait, like we're in the same secret right. club <laughs> that we like, we know and we're excited about this thing. It's exciting to see Betty Who fans come in and see me do something totally different. It's kind of vulnerable actually, because I think I expect them to come in and expect to see Betty and I'm not. I'm sure. trying to be Persephone and, and that is kind of, it's weird to see people wearing the Betty Who shirts in the audience. Cause I'm like, I'm i am not gonna sing Somebody Loves You For You, do you know what I mean? It's, we're gonna have a different experience tonight. But I think I'm also really excited to be in front of new people who have never heard of me. The other side of the cult that have been like, who's this? And have this be the first introduction of me to them. Cause I think it's so different from what I have done and normally do, but I'm bringing just as much rigor and, and trying to bring as much life to this performance as I possibly can and make this goddess actually really human. She has fun, but she also really, she really goes through it and she is feeling real pain caused by this person who she really loves. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I feel just really honored. Welcome back to the Broadway show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get back to it. Good evening, this is Dr. Emmett L. Brown and this is my time machine. A time machine? Ready to go back in time? It's Back to the Future of the Musical, now on Broadway. And Casey Likes plays Marty McFly. He's doing a vlog for us called The McFly Files. On Broadway.com, check out this preview. It's Back to the Future Day, which means that October 21st is the day that everyone traveled back in time. Uh, it actually, to the future in the second movie, and now it is a national holiday. And today we have very special guest, the original Marvin Berry from the movie Back to the Future. Harry Waters, Harry Waters Jr. Jr. Good afternoon. We have bad lighting behind us. Oh my God! Hi, we can actually see each other. Uh, yes, How yes, are yes. How are you all doing? Oh my gosh! So what did we just do, Harry? It was we had an amazing magic moment on stage here at the Winter Garden that I got to actually sing a duet of Earth Angel with Jemani. It was so much fun. It was, and the audience standing and screaming. It was it, one of the best moments I think I've ever had in my career. Just watch it because I was right in the middle of you guys, and the light was shining on you both. We were singing each other's faces. <laughs> Just amazing, man. You still it, got it. And, it. and it was great just being in that energy of the show with the people so much love. Oh my God, I'm humbled by all y'all and I still get to do this. So thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much for being really here. good too. Hey, oh, appreciate you, man. Joe Allen remains a fixture in the theater district and one of New York City's great local restaurants. Let's send it out to Perry Sook. Thanks, Tamsin. Joe Allen's restaurant is known for having posters of Broadway flops on the wall but the restaurant itself is a long running hit. I'm gonna head inside to learn some more. All right, we are right inside the door at the bar where we are lucky enough to get a seat uh, with the general manager, Mary Hatman. Now, Mary, right in the heart of the theater district, truly a staple to the theater community. Can you tell me a little of the history of Joe Allen's? So Joe opened in 1965, back when people didn't really go this side of 8th Avenue. Sardis was already around. All right. They were very supportive. They would like send people over. The workers, rather than the celebs, were, were hanging out here oh, wow. in the beginning, yeah. Uh, but then, it, as, as time went on, it just kept growing and, you know, turned into the spot. Now, another thing that I happen to love about the restaurant uh, is all of the posters of the flops of shows. Can you tell me a little about that? Well, apparently, what happened was it was not a plan. It was, oh. it was that the year Joe opened in 65, Kelly had gone on mm -hmm. and closed within 24 hours, within oh, the first performance. Now that was, it was a couple months before Joe actually opened. But when Joe opened, the cast came in here to supposedly celebrate what was, would have been their opening night mm. as a joke. <laughs> 
And they had the poster with them, and they said to Joe, you should really hang this up, you know, because this is probably going to be the biggest flop ever. Yeah, you know? well, where else could so they hang it? <laughs> that, was, that was the beginning of it. And then as it grew over the years, like, even publicists would send posters as soon as it failed, you know, like, <laughs> just to see if they could get it on the wall. Sure. Or personal friends or whatever. There was always somebody coming in saying, like, could you please, like, mm. at least we could get the poster up. All right, I'm at a place anyone can feel comfortable here at the bar with one of the wonderful bartenders here, That's Chris right. Rosansky. Uh, so I gotta ask, what would you say is the most popular drink here at Joe Allen? Anything classic, right? Joe Allen is very classic. When you come in here, you feel comfortable, you feel warm. It's like you're in your living room, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have to get too fancy with ingredients, things like that. So classic Manhattans, classic old fashions, the Cosmo, um, those type of things are the best to have at, at this bar here. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.